for filling that out, Bobby. I just want to uh, say I think that's it, it's actually really important to have some good examples for people to have a look at. So we'll certainly be, be working on that. We have been trying to put together or trying sorry trying to gather some rubrics that other people have, um, have put together. But I think now what we can do is you've given us a framework to be able to look at those rubrics that we've got and we can test them against that. So that's going to be really useful for us. Uh, so thanks very much for that. The big message, Jeff, as, as I've probably laboured uh, too much in my talk, is, is Sadler's point about fidelity, that uh, too many rubrics reward effort. Yeah, and Royce has actually been talking quite a bit about that lately, about that the idea of not rewarding effort but actually rewarding quality and the fidelity there is... I think it's going to be interesting to come up with those definitions of fidelity and I think it actually is a challenge to academics as well to be able to define in a very distinctive way what is it they're looking for in terms of quality, um, quality output from students and how does one describe that? How does one give... Uh, I know we can always say, you know, if you've, got, if you've got an example of it, you can show it to someone, but uh, how would you actually describe it in words? Uh, absolutely, uh, and, and the, other, the, the, the other point is that faculty may be deliberately seeking to reward skills like collaboration and cooperation because those skills are important. And, and, and you know, again, we know that collaboration and cooperation are hugely important skills, but until they are manifest in the learning outcomes, it's not fair to assess those skills. Uh, so, so, you know, if collaboration and cooperation are important, and I'm sure they are, we have to start writing them in to learning objectives. Yeah, absolutely. Chad, do you want to make a comment? Uh, yes, thanks, Bobby. Just wanted to say thanks for the presentation. Really, really fantastic and interesting. I was wondering if any of your research uh, has come across the issue of workload around uh, assessment and marking online discussions uh, and this feeds into obviously the, the broader uh, thinking around ru rubrics in general and do they make marking assessment easier more generally but I was wondering also if this feeds into the um, some of the really superficial assessment that you're talking about that you know it's a lot easier to um, you know uh, quantitatively judge someone's participation or um, you know how many times they've they've contributed, and I just wonder if uh, if you have any comments about just workload implications of um, assessing online discussions and the link to rubrics. Yes, I, I, I absolutely. Uh, it's it's uh, actually there's a reference in in my paper to that that one of the major problems of assessing online writing can, can be workload. Uh, so whatever we come up with, Jeff, it's got to be it's got to be practical. Uh, one of the problems of the rubrics is they tend to encourage micro marking, where uh, you know you go through every single message that's posted and give it one or zero or 1.5 marks, and that's a horrid way of assessing work. So it has tremendous workload implications unless we avoid doing that. Yeah, and I actually think that's a really interesting point then about. You know, what's what's the point of actually doing that? Um, I mean, and again, using Royce's ideas of, you know, uh, assessing what is actually worth assessing and assessing something that actually has quality. I mean, you can certainly use online discussions for students to be able to reflect, get feedback from each other, get feedback as they go along uh, in terms of their arguments or in terms of their uh, the, the quality of the their discussion and the way they put their ideas together, but then you want them to actually have a consolidated argument at the end that incorporates whatever feedback they've got from either their peers or their tutors or uh, whoever else. Um, and then from the academic's point of view, to spend their time uh, probably assessing in a summative way that, that part. I guess the issue I have sometimes, especially with David Bowd's work and even somewhat with Royce's work, uh, we've got to be careful then that we don't leave all the summative assessment till the end uh, because that also means that um, it weights the assessment tremendously on probably only a few activities and that's something that we also need to be careful about. Very good point, Jeff. Yeah, I, I agree.
I, 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 I'm also persuaded by your argument about the maybe inherently formative use of online discussions with some separate summative activity towards the end, you know, albeit with the drawbacks that you've mentioned. But yeah, I'm fairly persuaded by what you said there. Okay, I can see James's point there too. So uh, actually, two Jameses want to make a comment. So maybe James uh, Callum first, because you've got your hand up, and then I'm not sure whether uh, James Bottom would like to make a comment after that. Okay, James Callum, do you want to take the mic? Oh, okay, sorry about that then. Um, maybe we'll hand it over to James Botton and you can type in then, James, uh, any comments that you'd like to make. Uh, yeah, hi, Bobby. Um, I've just um, been working with Rubix for a couple of years on two different assessments and I feel like I'm often making quite subjective judgments on students' discussions and that's why I've made the comment about asking and getting specific answers for uh, specific questions. Um, have you got any comments about that? Not quite sure what what, what you mean, James. Uh, can can you explain a bit further? Um, I guess we're often relying on our own expertise to be able to judge a particular piece of work. Even with the rubrics, I'm not sure that we're able to link our expertise with um, a judgment of the student's work to a degree that the students will be able to understand what we're expecting of them. I'm not sure if I'm explaining myself particularly well. This exercise is quite uh, confusing, but um, does that make any sense at all? It, it does indeed. I, I fully understand your question now. I, I, absolutely, a, a rubric is not a panacea. It's not an algorithm. You know, we'll never arrive at a rubric that's crystal clear and, and objective. And in and, and all forms of assessment, that James, there's, there's a huge element of subjectivity. We have to be careful how subjective we make it. I, I said at the beginning I'm from the school and college sector. And can I say that school and college assessment is much less subjective than higher education assessment? Sometimes when I see HE practice, having just completed an HE master's course, you know, I, I was fairly surprised, and I'm using my words carefully, <laughs> about the subjectivity that seems to be fairly inherent inside higher education. But my, I agree, a rubric cannot, a rubric's not, not an algorithm, not, nor should it be an algorithm. There should be, must be an element of subjectivity, but it mustn't be entirely subjective. Thanks for that, Bobby. Uh, 